Hello and welcome to today's celebration of the life and work of Royal Society of Literature fellow Jan Morris. I'm Molly Rosenberg, director of the Royal Society of Literature, and it's my pleasure to open this evening's conversation between writers influenced by Jan's work a year after she died. We're really pleased that we're joined today by so many of Jan's colleagues uh, and those closest to her, as well as her readers. Thank you all for being with us uh, tonight. This evening, the RSL is glad to be working again with our partners, the British Library and production company, Unique Media. Our thanks to you all for making this discussion possible. Before I hand over to the brilliant Shahid Abari, uh, our chair for this evening, to welcome Pico Ayer, CN Lester and Sarah Moss, I'll give my own very small welcome and introduction to Shahid Shahid Abari is a writer, academic and broadcaster. She's a professor at Lon the London College of Fashion at the University of the Arts London. She read English at King's College Cambridge and critical theory at Cornell University. She's a fellow of the Forum of Philosophy at the London School of Economics. You can hear her on radio and TV uh, as a guest presenter of Inside Culture on BBC Two and a regular host of BBC Radio 3's Arts and Ideas programme, Free Thinking. You can also read her in the Financial Times, Freeze Art Magazine, The Guardian, The Observer, The Times Literary Supplement and others, or you can pick up her wonderful book, Dressed, The Secret Life of Clothes. Over to you, Shahida. Thank you, Molly. Hello and welcome to this vital discussion run by the Royal Society of Literature. This event celebrates the life of the great travel writer and Royal Society of Literature fellow Jan Morris on the first anniversary of her death. Book lovers, she wrote, will understand me and they will know too that part of the pleasure of a library lies in its very existence. So if you're watching this, then we assume you too are part of the community of book lovers. Part of the pleasure of Jan Morris's work was its range, a writing life that takes us from the summit of Mount Everest by the canals of Venice and occupied Trieste to North Wales. Here to talk about the life and legacy of Jan Morris, we have writers Pico Ayer, C.N. Lester and Sarah Moss. Travel writer Pico Ayer is the author of numerous works of fiction and non-fiction, translated into many languages, including Video Night in Kathmandu, The Lady and the Monk and The Global Soul. He's been an essayist for Time, The New York Times, Harper's and more. His TED Talks have received over 11 million views. He served as Ferris Professor at Princeton University, guest director of the Telluride Film Festival and was the first official writer in residence at Raffles Hotel, Singapore. Hello, Pico. Hello. C.N. Lester is a multidisciplinary musician, a leading LGBTI activist and author of Trans Like Me, which explores transgender identity and the struggle for authenticity in a world of labels. They curate the Trans Pose Arts event for Barbican and they work into Latin. They work internationally as a trans and feminist educator. Their work has featured on the BBC, The Guardian, ABC, The Independent, Newsnight and at Sydney Opera House. CN co-founded the first ever national UK group for young LGBT people. Hello, CN. Hi, lovely to have be here. To have me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need we, are. we are together virtually. And yeah. Sarah Moss is the author of eight novels, including the Sunday Times top 10 bestseller, Summer Water and Ghost War, which was listed for the Women's Prize and shortlisted for the RSL on Dutchie Prize. She was born in Glasgow and grew up in the north of England. Now she teaches English and creative writing at University College Dublin. Her new novel, The Fell, is set in the Peak District during the lockdown and has just been released. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Great to meet you. And you too, it's really lovely to have you. And what a treat to be able to talk about a writer as gifted and as provocative, I think, as Jan Morris. Um, mm -hmm. Before we start, let's set the scene a little. J Jan Morris was a historian, author and travel writer born in 1926 to Welsh and English parents. And Wales, of course, would be an important part of her life and work, um, most particularly that top left-hand corner of Wales. Um, uh, between the mountains and the sea, where she lived with her wife, Elizabeth. She's particularly known for the Pax Britannica trilogy from 1968 to 1978, a history of the British Empire, and for portraits of cities, including Oxford, Venice, Trieste, Hong Kong, and New York City. She was an accomplished novelist, and she was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 1961. 
It was an exciting life in so many ways. She was a member of the 1953 British Mount Everest expedition and she served in the Second World War in Trieste as a regimental intelligence officer. Early works were published under her birth name, James, until her transition in 1972. And the story of that is recounted in Conundrum, which was one of the first memoirs of that kind. And although memoir, novels and travel writing would become the genres with which she was most associated, works like the 2001 Trieste and The Meaning of Nowhere blurred those distinctive boundaries. In 2019, she published In My Mind's Eye, a collection of her diary entries and allegorizings, the latest book, uh, I tried to put a camera there, <laughs> uh, is a reflection on key moments and memories from her life. And that was published by Favour earlier this month. So many entry points into Jan's work. Perhaps that's where we start. I, it would be useful to know where you first encountered Jan Morris's work and what you made of it. Are you able to recall? Um, maybe Sarah, I can ask you that. Hmm. I think the first one I read was Venice, um, before a trip to Venice. And I love Venice. I mean, I, I keep planning to go back while it's still quiet after lockdown. I'm sure it's not actually quiet after lockdown, but that's my fantasy. And I think it can be quite a difficult city to approach because, because it's so touristy and because it's hard, it's somehow hard to get a grip on it. There's something quite kind of slippery um, about going to Venice. I think probably the weight of everybody else who's been to Venice and the yeah, just the volume of tourism and the difficulty of talking to people who actually live there. And that book is very erudite, but it's also quite friendly. And I think it gave me a way of thinking about Venice as an outsider and feeling legitimate about being an outsider. When I was reflecting on what Jan Morris's work has really meant to me, I was thinking that she gives you permission to be an outsider. She legitimizes that, that sense of alienation which I really enjoy. I think the idea that you, I mean, my thinking about travel and place writing is always based on the idea that what we aspire to is to be able to have belonging without ownership, you know, to feel a commitment to and a relationship with a place without feeling a need to exclude other people from it. And there aren't actually very many writers who do that, that she does. And she does it with these iconic cities. The other book that really helped me was the Oxford book. I'm actually speaking from Oxford now and I'm, I'm on a book tour. But I came to university here when I was 18 as a young woman from the north of England, very skeptical about Oxford's exclusivity and its social cachet and very worried about who I was going to meet. And with a real sense that everybody else there already knew you know, all the special words for things and how to walk through a porter's lodge and all of that stuff that you, you just did not learn growing up in Manchester in the 80s and 90s. And again, she gave me permission to be an intelligent outsider and to, to know stuff as an outsider. And I think those, those two books were the really valuable ones for me at the beginning. And then I went on and read a lot more of her work. I think we're already getting some characterizations of Jan's work that we would recognize this idea of belonging without ownership seems like a really important way of understanding her her sensibility as a traveler and the intelligent outsider is absolutely her perspective I think isn't it so thank you for that Sarah. Pico what about you where did you start with Jan's work? Uh, really at school and I remember being exhilarated and liberated at the same time because we were having to trudge through all the classics uh, and they felt so out of tune with what was happening in the world. And suddenly there was Jan Morris writing in a classical style that we could associate with Virginia Woolf or Hazlitt or somebody, but writing for Rolling Stone and writing about the cutting edge and as likely to be seen in, in a youth magazine like Rolling Stone as in The Spectator. Uh, and, and I loved what Sarah was just saying, because I think Jan, this is another way of saying the same thing, really taught me to be unaffiliated. Uh, and that I didn't have to be pressed into any category, I didn't have to belong. And when I was first reading her, these were pre-internet days, and there was a sense that if you wanted to be a central literary figure, you had to be in London and New York. And I love the fact she was always in the margins, um, at an angle. Um, she would extol every part of Britain except England itself. Uh, and I think she also very early gave me a sense uh, that... Um, well, the thing that struck me, I suppose, going, going back to Oxford, which is where I was born and, and, and grew up, is that 
where, whenever Jan Morris would write about a place where I'd lived, which is Manhattan or Los Angeles or Kyoto now or Oxford, she would get it intuitively better than any visitor I could imagine, as well as seeing things um, that I don't think any local person um, would, would ever see. And I think she, in some ways, gave me a sense of how to live. And this notion, when I was in my teens, that you could travel around the world, visit its great cities, and take them to be your friends in some ways. And I liked what Sarah was saying about being both friendly and erudite. Uh, because Jan writes about place as if they're the main people in her lives. And she's always very appreciative, but she's also undeluded. And she writes about them as you would about your, the closest people in your lives. You see them warts and all, but you always find something to affirm in them. So suddenly she, she made me think, oh, I can roam around the world, live simply, uh, and, and try to live off the impressions that I share. I think we're going to really look forward to learning more from you about Jan's travel writing, because I think that's right, isn't it? That sense of perception without illusion is absolutely critical to the way that she viewed the world. See, and where, where did you start with Jan Morris's work? I think something which I find very interesting with Jan Morris's work is that I first encountered it really as a kind of cultural artifact and, and part of a historical record. So for me, it was not reading conundrum as a young person trying to sort of come out as trans I, I was you know by that point a very different generation so coming from that sort of post 90s trans liberation viewpoint conundrum felt like a very very different book and when I really sat down with it and and sort of began to appreciate it properly was as a researcher so looking into the history of trans narrative the history of trans medicalization and how that book fitted within a very very long tradition if we're thinking of the sort of first what we might think of as trans memoir appearing at the end of the 19th century morris's book is already old in in its tradition and is already sort of though published in 1973 working from a lot of the values espoused by late 19th century to, to mid 20th century sexologists. And, and as a researcher, it was so interesting to, to take this deep dive going, which, where is Jan here? And where is Harry Benjamin? And what's happening behind the scenes? And how much can I trust this author? And, and it, it was such a multi-leveled book but at the end, I think what really touched me most was not anything to do with, with being trans, or, or sort of any kind of shared understanding of, of bodies and what it is to, to feel the self to be um, in need of expansion or change. But it was that sense of enchantment in her writing. And actually the point where I felt closest to her was I have a Welsh mother and an English father. And in her <laughs> writing about the magic of places that I think enchantment is the word I wanna keep coming back to with her writing. She has that storyteller's eye and that sense of the the magical that that door in the wall that sort of in sort of for magical corner where where something could turn into the other and there's always a story just lurking underneath the surface um and that in a roundabout way brought me back to conundrum um not so much as a shared trans understanding but as a shared human understanding of where might the magic in our own lives lie and where's the story that we follow and, and what mysteries can we uncover along the way not to expose them, but sometimes just to revel in, in their unknowability and the beauty of that. Wonderful. Doesn't this sound like it's going to be a lovely conversation? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder whether I can ask all three of you where we place Jan's writing. We've been talking about a range of genres and traditions, but is there, in, to your mind, is there a particular place that you think she belongs in the history of the 20th century novel or travel writing or trans memoir how, how do we place her writing if you if you had to give us a top line as to where she belonged could could you do that pika i'm going to pick on you first i would say a master historian with a fascination for the new and if i were allowed a second line i would say she's the first person to chronicle all the cities of the globe in that sense one of our first global writers a, a global writer. I think that's a good way of putting it. Sarah? I was just thinking that she's she's almost one of those kind of hinge figures of the 20th century. I mean, some of what she writes about empire, I think we would find quite difficult, 
now and her sense that you can somehow divide the aesthetics from the politics of empire and that this, I mean I think she was being willfully provocative but there's a way that you can celebrate the flag waving and the music and the you know the marching about from the violence I think we would now find very problematic um, but at the same time I was thinking as you were speaking about the tradition of travel writings I really like and admire, and I'm thinking about people like Jonathan Rabin and Kathleen Jamie, mm -hmm. who I think share that commitment to, to the outside, the intelligence of the outsider perspective, to, to belonging without ownership. Um, so I think she's really at that moment where travel writing is beginning to move away from being quite so plotted in with empire and colonialism. I mean, she's not looking down on people. It's not exactly part of an ongoing colonial or imperial project, although it's still in quite a dark relationship with that colonial and imperial project. But she's moving towards something much more distinctive and interesting that we see coming in in the later 20th century. And I think that very much fits in with her own life history and lifespan between serving in World War II, being around for Everest, which goodness knows is, you know, empire and colonialism in some ways at its, at its most obvious. Um, and then moving forward into the later 20th century, where we're looking at different perspectives and thinking differently about, about the outsider's point of view. So I'd, I'd really see her, I'd want to historicize her. I think if we don't do that, we're going to have a lot of difficulty with her. Yes. Um, but I'd really see her kind of facing, actually facing two ways in relation to travel writing and ideology, as well as in relation to all kinds of other things. Yeah, yeah, facing two ways. Sian? I think what I find really fascinating sort of across her works is her, her own admission that she relies on generalization, she relies on sweeps, she, you know, there is a sense that she is an impressionistic writer rather than, you know, it, this is not a footnoted academic work, despite her enormous learning and her enormous curiosity about life. And I think in that respect, she reminds me so very much of reading sort of Virginia Woolf's quite casual life writing. I, I want to say life writing rather than any other form of life. It, it's that sense of a tremendously inquisitive mind looking around and saying, how can I translate this into the poetry and the meter and the, the rhythm of, of language? Um, and for that, it almost feels to me to, to be, I, it makes me think of people like Joan Didion actually, and, and a lot of other writers who sort of wrote in that impressionistic style and even looking towards people who have used social media. I'm thinking of Rebecca Solnit, um, that she writes these beautiful posts on Facebook. There is that sense of using short form and long form and whatever form you're in, reaching out and, and creating that personal connection to the reader. It feels very friendly. All of her writing feels like I could just be sitting with her having a coffee or, you know, a glass of wine, uh, which I think she would have enjoyed. And she was like, well, let me tell you this. And you're thinking, yes, I, I want to hear more. It's, you know, it's a master storyteller. Well, talking of friendliness, Pika, you, you knew her personally, didn't you? So what was she like in person? Uh, intrepid, uh, <laughs> fearless and, and resourceful. I remember the very first time uh, I met her was uh, in a lobby in San Francisco. And I asked her, how are you feeling? And she said, I think I'm characteristically awful. And I said glibly, well, I've heard that the, the best cure for jet lag is, is to walk barefoot on, um, on grass. The next thing I know, there she was in her mid seventies, striding out of the lobby, taking off her shoes and walking across <laughs> the nearest courtyard. And I think it speaks to that sense of openness and curiosity that CN was just describing. And I loved when CN was talking about mystery because I think it's that mixture of openness and mystery that makes her such a beguiling presence on the page, just as um, it's her gift for blending fact and feeling that reminds me of say, Joan Didion. Um, but, and the other thing that struck me was that same first time I met her, she is, goes back to what Sarah was just saying, she was seeking out some of these old sorts of, of empire and their memories of the Raj or whatever in Northern California, but she was doing so in this really racy, open-topped blue American sports car. Uh, and I always felt that her writing on empire was to some extent redeemed by the fact that she was always on the side of the renegade and the outlier and, and the maverick. And as, as Sarah was saying, she, uh, she could exult in some of the finer points, arguably, with grace notes of empire, while uh, always preserving her, her sympathies for its victims. 
Should we talk a little bit more in earnest about Jan's travel writing? In, in an interview with the BBC in 2016, she told Michael Palin that she didn't like to be described as a travel writer, as her books are not about movement and journeys. They are about places and people, which is a rather nice distinction, mm. I think. I wonder, Pika, maybe I can start with you about this. What made Jan unique among writers of place? Uh, that she wasn't giving us a, a, an account of a journey, but in fact, as you said, a portrait on place. And that I was used to the travel writing that was really a kind of spruced up diary and a chronological account of going from place to place. And as, as has already been said, in place of that, she brought she would weave these shimmering tapestries that really were, as, as CN said, life studies, they were depictions of the innermost character of a place. Um, and it was a much more artful and subversively subjective way of, of, of catching a place and, and just um, much more work of literature, I would say, than, than, than the kind of I went there and then I went there account that I was used to. And because she had such fine instincts that were only refined by the number of places she, she went, as I say, I felt I could, I could trust her. And, and part of the mystery of Jan um, was that she kept keeps herself out of her writing so much. Mm -hmm. She's always there, you're always aware of her judgments, her preferences and her enthusiasms, but the piece is never about Jan. You get the sense that she's a very responsive person. Um, and and that, uh, as has been said already, she was just taking in everything around her. And, and her aim every time she shared a 20 page essay on a city was to give us that city in all its vitality and complexity and contradictions and, and not smudge it with her own personality. Uh, and that's a rare gift too that not many travelers can manage um, to, to, to be entirely in the picture but take themselves out of, of what they're saying really. You're, you're nodding along Sarah or you were a moment ago. Mm, no I was um... I was thinking that it's a kind of writing for which we still don't have a very successful word. I teach it um, and the course I teach I call writing places because it's not travel writing with all of those kind of heroic implications of the quest narrative. Um, I sort of want to call it place writing but that's not not really an accepted term and I think we're still quite short of words for non-fiction so yes absolutely and I was thinking about the flirtatiousness often of her kind of <laughs> vaguely autobiographical writing where she'll drop a little hint and then back off and they'll say well if you haven't got it there's no you know it's like a teenager if you don't understand there's no point in me trying to tell you anything but I don't understand you know, do it. and I was thinking that reading allegorizing that she keeps it, it's such a kind of flirtatious peekaboo book where she says it's very intimate but it doesn't actually seem very intimate and then she says well if you can't see the intimacy then you don't get it and I think am I not getting it is there a game going on here you know can I can I find some personal revelation here where it, it's really kind of tricksy writing did you want to come in Cian? um I think mainly maybe just as a musician I always love her musical sort of illusions and that that always brings it and it it has that delight for me that her mu her, her writing is tremendously musical as well and then when she starts bringing in the music that she's listening to or or that it it is a multi-sensory form of writing and I I love in conundrum how she talks so much about how she's a sensualist um and that that, that sort of sense of erotic um diffusion I think comes through her writing and in its appreciation for all those tangible uh, and visceral elements of, of where she is. It, I think that's the most incredible thing for a reader that um, there you are with her because it is so tactile and audible as a, as a way of writing. You're, you're making her sound very alluring. She's a musical flirt so far in our conversation. Uh, how delightful is that? Um, Pico, I, you're going to share a little reading with us, which is, I think, a, an extract from a piece that you wrote about Jan. And I think it will give us a sense of the kind of travel writer that she was. Uh, yes, and if I may, I, I, just to pick up on what Sarah was saying a minute ago, what I loved about allegorizings was that it's a declaration of independence in some ways, and it's a statement of her creed, 
you know, at one point she says, give me callowness, give me fizz, give me your responsibility. But as I was reading it, I started noting down the adjectives. And I really did notice that everything on every one she wrote about was a suitably discreet and disguised self-portrait. Even she walks through a college in uh, Oxford and she says it's a serene and private. Oh, no, that sounds like her. <laughs> and then she describes three ocean liners and she says they're elegant, racy and strong. Hmm, who could that be? <laughs> then suddenly she encounters is a furrier born to a Hungarian refugee. And she says that his great qualities were to be kind, merry, and generous. And again, that almost is an affirmation of what she believed in, and I think a declaration of who she thought herself to be. Mm. And in the Trieste book, what's lovely about it is that she gives us this watery in between, left behind, rather wistful place. And you realize very quickly um, that she's writing about herself. And I remember, to go back to a memory I had of her, I, I kept that book once for Christmas morning, and I read it on Christmas Day, and I wrote to her instantly, and I said, this is not just the best book you've ever written, but the most revealing. And uh, with, with Jani and fluency, she wrote back immediately and said, yeah, that's how I think about it, too. This is, this is my autobiography. Um, I, don't, I, I apologize for reading, but um, this won't take too long, and one of many pieces I've written on her. Morris likes people, even if she does not always like the countries in which they live. And there's an early morning freshness to her prose. The nighttime scenes that are often most distinctive in others are missing from her work. You can imagine her talking to everyone she passes on her morning walk, as she describes herself doing, or saying, even in Sydney, having excoriated it before, that youth, hope, and silliness go together in cities as in people, and it's the hope that counts. When she admires the patient fatalism of India, you can't help feeling that she's telling us something about herself, describing, quote, a kindly acceptance of things as they are, supported by the sensible thesis that things are not always what they appear to be. What's made her the definitive chronicler of empire is the fact that she can respond with warmth to both the purple swagger and the swank of its rulers, and even more perhaps to its mavericks and victims. It's, quote, the flash of underlife that gives most great cities their variety, she writes. And it's she who relishes most that the book of her essays put out by Oxford University Press was originally written for Rolling Stone. Style, panache, spirit are her thing, and her sentences are a near perfect blend of ceremony and quiet subversion. Thank you. How perfect. Is, do you think, uh, Pikun, knowing Jan's work, that there is a city above all others that she understood best of all, or a place? I think Venice. Venice was closest to her heart, maybe. But what always struck me is that she went every single year back to Venice and Manhattan, this classical European city, and you know the last word in what's coming tomorrow. Um, and that seemed to be very much, I, I love the, the Janus faced quality that came out earlier, looking both ways. Uh, and as I said, to me, that's what made her unusual as a chronicler of empire, that she was always looking to the future. And in some ways, she seemed to me this classically almost Victorian Brit of a, of a vanished age. Um, and, and yet... Um, she was in love with young and, and, and brash America. In allegorizings, it's very much the book of somebody in her 80s, but she's, love, she's cherishing everything about youth and she's always on the side uh, of the young, I felt. Um, and, and yourself as a writer of travel, do you have a sense of how the, 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 the subsequent tradition, traditions of travel writing that have emerged might be indebted to Jan's work? I certainly am. I mean, when I began writing, it was embarrassing to me because um, everything I wrote looked like lesser toned down, <laughs> a muted jam. Um, I, I mean, I think she influenced me more than any writer, especially when I began to write. And more than that, the particulars, I mean, not just the length of the sentences and the texture of the paragraphs, but I would go to the zoo wherever I went and I would go to the cemetery and I, and I would pick up the telephone book. And I realized all of these were things uh, I'd almost subconsciously subconsciously um, picked up from, from Jan. And again, what makes her such a pivotal figure is her cadences, her diction, the length of her paragraphs are so 
old style, and yet the buoyancy and energy of them are, are so much 21st century. Even a few years ago, every now and then reading the New York Times, I'd come upon this really irrepressible, fizzy uh, piece of prose. And I think here's the latest, you know, 22 year old Wunderkind out of college. And I'd go to the byline and there was Jan Morris aged 88. I mean, she never grew old in a sense. Isn't that a great tip as well whenever you're at a, in a new place go to the zoo and pick up the phone book I always read the parish notices or pick up a local newspaper but yeah, now I shall go yeah. to the zoo um, uh, too um, Sarah can we can we shift our conversation to talk about the, the novels and the, the writing we've already started to talk about Jan's particular skill here um, as a novelist how, how do we characterize her work what are its features do you think? I actually read her travel writing far more than her novels, which mm. is really interesting. And I find I find the travel writing really novelistically helpful. I mean, I was I'm always a bit skeptical about the division between fiction and nonfiction anyway. But I think the travel writing teaches the novelist so much about observation and looking and noticing and you know, place and character. And how to write about the unfamiliar, which, which is really important. So for me, she's, I don't know, she's a writer of the real somehow. She's, yeah, I don't, I don't think of her much as a novelist, which I'm sure is my weakness, but it's the travel writing that I really, really love and return to. But I, I wonder what it is about, that, that makes perfect sense to me, but I wonder what it is about the, the travel writing that would appeal to a writer of fiction like you. What, is it about the form, the sentences, or the imagery, yeah. whatever it is, that makes her a, a writerly writer, as it were? Yeah. I think it's something to do with what we've been talking about in relation to her individuality and her... I'm kind of reaching towards the word subjective, but I'm always pretty sceptical of that in relation to writing because, you know, subjectivity and objectivity don't really apply. Um, her willingness to have, I know what it is, it's her willingness to have her own encounters with a place, that she's there quite freshly and immediately. And although, as we said before, she's very erudite, she, you know, she's read everybody else who's been there and she's read quite a lot of the history, she is absolutely present to place in a way that feels unmediated and is absolutely not unmediated, but that's, that's part of her gift. So I think it's that kind of, rawness or openness or almost agnosticism in the face of the new in the face of a new experience that that teaches us all how to write yeah Sian, do you want to come in here do you have a sense of Jan's fiction or her, her writerliness I've not read her fiction yeah. so I do apologize I think I, I really um gravitated towards the, the sort of Trieste and Venice and sort of Hong Kong places that that i have been very important to me or, or that I've lived um so I apologize there it's on my to read list <laughs> but you I mean I, I think I'm quite interested that you've already said that you um you place her next to Virginia Woolf for instance that we we are understanding her in a writerly context and at Pika you were talking about her as a as a as a Victorian in some ways in, in her sensibility so um I think your point Sarah that, that the line between um, fiction and non-fiction is decidedly indistinct for, for Jan Morris, yeah. I think, I wonder if, uh, another way to ask this question to all of you is that the people who don't know her work, where should they start? Um, CN, maybe you've got a thought on that. Well, I, I would be, um, I, I'm prejudiced because the, the composer that I spend the most time with academically and performatively performance-wise is Barbara Strozzi, who was a great, great Venetian composer whose music yes is so of the place and I, I I would say if you would love a sort of intro you know read Jan Morris on Venice listen to some Venetian composers Vivaldi, Monteverdi, um, Cavalli, Strozzi and and get that sense of oh it's just romance I mean it, it is impossible romance and that water <laughs> fluidity and the light that, that sort of streams through um, I've never actually been to Venice in the summer. I've only ever been in January. Um, and, and that sort of beautiful, watery, dappled light. Um, and I think Trieste, similar, similarly, it's got that sort of... It, it just feels like a, a romance. I can't, I can't describe it in any other way. And there is that... 
it, it makes me feel quite swoony. Um, and I'm in the absolute best way that this is not, but maybe again, coming back to Pico's point about this sort of Victorian sensibility, there is that sense of sort of reading something which is is lush and yet formal. And, and I would recommend that, but actually having only recently read In My Mind's Eye, I think that's a lovely way in to the Rhinus. Again, that, we keep talking about this sort of Janus figure, but but the the holding it together, both, you know, heart on sleeve and ironic, you know, both hopeful and hopeless. It, it is the everyday, it's the magical, it's it's a really lovely way in, I think. Yeah. I think we're really getting a sense of her writing, fiction or nonfiction. Pika, did you did you have an entry point for for, for reading Jan Morris? Would you suggest something? I would recommend to anybody among the cities, which is really just a collection of 50 portraits, some very short, many 20 pages long, of the great cities of the world. Some of these written in the 1950s when she was writing these quick dispatches for the Guardian uh, and some of the 10,000 word pieces uh, for the Rolling Stone. When CN was talking just a minute ago, I was loving the fact that if I'm right, uh, uh, Sarah called Jan perfectly a writer of the real and CN was pointing out what a romancer she is. And there's again, the sort of heart of, of Jan, which is almost a sense she could surrender emotionally to the way maybe she would dream a place would be. But at the same time, she was acutely taking note of every last detail. So you never feel that she's she's taking um, taking poetic license, as it were. She's getting a place precisely, but she's able to see maybe what it dreams it, it could be in its best self. Sarah? Yeah, I would also start with Venice. And it, it's interesting, as Tien was talking about the romance and the swooning, I was thinking, yes, yes, that's absolutely the appeal of that book. But, you know, Pico's also right that I just called her a writer of the real. Um, and I was thinking about the difference for me between reading the Venice book when I've been to Venice several times, though also never in the summer, um, mm -hmm. and Trieste, which I haven't been to and would like to go to. I'm wondering if there's a difference between reading her when you've been to the place and reading her when you haven't been to the place, because those are the two books I would choose. And it's interesting that there's there's one where I visited and one one that I haven't. And I'm not sure I would have particularly wanted to go to Trieste if I hadn't read her book either. So mm -hmm. there's something there about the relationship of her writing with its, with its locations mm -hmm. that's quite interesting. What a great reading list so far. Um, I, let's turn again. Sien, perhaps I can come to you to talk more about Jan's, the significance of Jan as a figure for the trans community. When, when you were, I think Pico said he read Jan at school and I did too. Mm -hmm. And at the time, of course, I had no idea um, mm -hmm. of her, her story, which I think is part of the, um, the importance of her story that mm -hmm. actually you could read a great deal of her work and not know that about her, mm -hmm. although also featured in her, her memoirs. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how significant a figure has she been? Is she for the trans community? I mean, I, I think she is tremendously significant, but it's not easy to put in a straightforward kind of way. Um, there's a beautiful essay by Stephanie Burt on what it is to read Conundrum Now. I think it's in Paris Review. Um, and I, I would urge everyone to go and read that before you read Conundrum, because I think it, it gives you such a wonderful um, grounding in what's going on. And I think it's an odd backwards and forwards sense because there is this breadth which is so wonderful and particularly as we are we are you know at the moment we're in a pretty bad cultural transphobic backlash and I think I am not the only in fact every trans person I know both as friends as colleagues um, there is a real sense that the walls are closing down and everything we do is pushed through this incredibly narrow lens of you know it has to be about this it has to be about this kind of debate which has been fostered onto you and, and which you didn't choose to be part of um and here's Jan sort of dancing away in a sports car <laughs> with a glass of <laughs> saying no I'm gonna go on. and I love that I absolutely adore that and I um I, I don't know if this is the point to sort of bring up other works but but I, you know for, for this discussion was asked what what books um we would like to see and there are two books out recently one by uh, Harry Josie Giles um, called Deep Wheel or uh, Orcadia, and one by Ju uh, Josephine Jakes. Josephine, my brain is really going. Juliet. Juliet, yes. My brain is working very well. I apologize. Um, called Variations. And both of them, I feel, I, I hope that Jan would have approved. You have sort of 
um, sort of H.A.'s book, which is a sci-fi poetic take on Orkney. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is that wonderful mixture of the absolute romance, the deep, sense of place sense of possibilities playfulness playing with the with the reader's expectations and and Juliet's book of these historical stories again sort of Jan's place of history and, and both of them so far removed from the narrow bounds that we frequently find ourselves in as trans people and I love that about about Jan's work her inspiration I do find Conundrum a very difficult book and I think as I have maybe expressed maybe it's a very different read from someone who is trans and who knows the history than, than maybe someone who isn't. So all the way the language through is not of, it's not necessarily of its time. And that's what's very interesting to me. It's of some parts of its time, but at other parts, you know, she completely rejects sort of other more, more radical readings that were happening at the same time. Um, and the pressure, you know, one of her doctors was Harry Benjamin and Harry Benjamin very famously set up systems whereby he was an arbiter of who counted as a true transsexual, which is a, a term you see over and over again in Morris's work, with set phrases that acted as shibboleth that, that you could access treatment through Benjamin and his ilk if you could find the right narrative, if you could put it into words. And all the way through Conundrum, we see Benjamin's clinical language reflected in Jan's story about herself. And I'm, I, I can't help but think, did this language originate in your own conception of yourself or was that a later edition which then later made sense of the narrative and a book like that is both a, a, a huge life-saving gift to so many people and yet at the same point you know in, in Jan's description of people who were not true transsexuals of people that she sort of deemed sexual perverts or, or sort of people who were psychotic or mentally unwell who didn't deserve to transition you, you set up that double yeah. double-edged sword it could be a gift or it could be a punishment to read that book yeah. um, so I think it I think it's a beautiful book and it's but it's difficult you know, the, the moments where she's really tackling her own racism are difficult to read. That you know, It is not a straightforward, you know, oh, you think you might be trans? Go out and read this book. I think it's much, much more, it is a mystery in and of itself. I, it, it, you know, it, I don't want to sound horrifically um, corny, but it's called Conundrum. It's a conundrum of a book. It's not, <laughs> yes. it's not straightforward. Um, so I think, she couldn't be reduced to one one simple um, yeah. figure, the trans community, because she's so many. I, and I, I, I do think that book, I mean, it must, it demonstrates tremendous courage to oh, confront yeah. with openness those conundrums, actually, mm -hmm. um, both for yourself, but you know, on a, on a, on a, in a public sphere as well, in mm -hmm. that way. But I, I wonder whether there is a place for Jan Morris, and if, if, there, if it is a, a widely acknowledged place mm -hmm. in um trans writing and trans history uh, where we are historicizing the phenomenon yeah. that seems to me really important that it is not just something that's been happening in the 2020s mm. but something that was has always been happening and has always been a conundrum and has been wrestled with in complicated ways i absolutely and i think there is this wonderful aspect you know, you, you read Conundrum and in it you have Jan Morris writing about the Chevalier Deon and, you, you know, you have you Jan Morris. the Chevalier Deon. Uh, okay, uh, so the Chevalier Deon um, is an amazing figure in history. I almost don't want to spoil too much. <laughs> I, I believe that her portrait might still be in the National Portrait Gallery. Yes, I think uh, it's going to be hung. Yep, a spy, a diplomat, um, a tremendous sword fighter, and there were bets on the London Stock Exchange, as it was back then, about what sex she actually was. And it, it, again, it, it feels almost, you know, if Jan Morris hadn't written about her as a historical figure, maybe Morris may have had to make her up because she is such a perfect example of, of what we're getting at. Um, but there's so much debate, obviously, you know, who, who was Dayon? Was she, would, would she, we say that she's a trans woman now? Would, would we not? You know, some scholars were, were very sort of insistent saying, no, 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 you know, he just pretended to be a woman as a diplomatic mission or a spy mission, whereas sort of more evidence which has now been uncovered would indicate maybe that's not the case and maybe she really did understand herself as a woman as she lived. Um, and it brings me, certainly as a, as a trans researcher and writer, currently writing my own history 
of, of place and of, of gender and gender variance into that impossibility of, of knowing what we can't know. You know, the, the known knowns, the known unknowns, the unknown unknown, it, all of that kind of stuff. You, you have Morris who is so curious and so open an intellect writing a book where she clearly was not open or curious about quite a lot of other things she could have drawn from. And yet here am I sort of researching into Morris thinking, oh, well, I'm doing the same thing. We're only human. Of course, we're going to be doing this as well. It, it, I don't know how best to describe this, except that I, I don't think it is helpful to think in terms of, oh, then this person is a, is a heroine to the trans community and this person is a villain. You know, she is an enormously important figure yeah. and she is real and tangible and human in the way that we all are. And it would be wrong to say that that's all 100% positive, but, yes. but by saying that I'm not negating the tremendous positivity either because it is incredible. And she did save lives by what she wrote, what she did. And, and I would not want to denigrate that at all. Um, and maybe there's a humility of her writing and maybe encourages the humility of the reader and also the writer themselves to think, well, we're all just doing our best. And again, maybe in that sense of travel and place, all I can do is sort of look into the phone book and, you know, look at the zoo and think, where am I now? Um, I, think that, I think that's very well said. And we, we must get a reading from you in a moment because I know you've selected something um, of Jan's work. But I, I just want to give Pico and Sarah a moment to come in on the question of, of memoir um, and that part of Jan's writing, whether you had any thoughts that you wanted to add to CNs there. As, well, as, I, as, I, as I'm listening to our discussion develop, I keep thinking that Jan was basically mischievous and majestic at the same time, which is a really unusual combination. And I think one word that one needs to invoke is pleasure, because it seems that's the, the word that, that rings through allegorizes, allegorizings. And an earlier book of hers, Memoirish, was Pleasures of a Tangled Life. Mm -hmm. And one thing that strikes me as I, I listen to CN talk about conundrum is whether it's in conundrum or in navigating very difficult parts of the world mm -hmm. to which most travel writers are, are hostile or are, are quick to, to share their, their discomforts. Jan was sort of indomitable and it's striking and allegorizing. She gets robbed in Venice, in fact, and that episode, <laughs> she comes out with an unforced happy ending. Uh, later, she's overcharged by a cab driver and she says, oh, he's an endearing old rascal, bless him. And there was something about the way that Jan was just kind of, uh, pleasure craft is <laughs> sailing at high speed through the waters and really undented by any iceberg um, that came her way. And I think that's a rare gift. There was a, some degree of resilience in her um, uh, that nothing would really throw her off course, including maybe that remarkable change of, of genders midlife. Sarah, did you want to add anything? I don't think I've much to add really. I mean, I think it, I go back to what I said about allegorizing. So there's this kind of hide and seek game going on that, that, that I like, but find slightly frustrating. And I think Pico is absolutely right about the, the resting on pleasure. I was rereading Pleasures of a Tangled Life a couple of days ago and thinking she's so gloriously unashamed about the primacy of pleasure in her life, <laughs> um, sometimes quite provocatively, but you don't very often read that. And I wonder how it, how we might see it in relation to some of the issues of identity that she is absolutely upfront. You know, it's not moralized. Um, mm. she's, not, she's not interested in kind of moral grandstanding at all. She's interested in, in sensuality and pleasure and fun. And I think that it's quite hard to integrate that into many of our public discussions and debates. At the moment, we don't make much space for, for pleasure. Um, so that's one of the things I like about her, I think, that, that insistence that pleasure has huge value and that we should we should prioritise it. Mm -hmm. Dan, should we, should we get the reading? I think you've selected something from In My Mind's Eye, which is a collection mm -hmm. of diary entries, is that right? I did. I thought um, I, I wanted to read her entry for day 186, simply because it felt that for me, it, it, it really captured her combination of magic and everyday, which I find so enchanting. I, I keep saying the word enchanting, but that's what it, it feels like she's casting a spell. Um, so 
When the skies are clear, once or twice a day, I see the silent white streaks of vapor trails high among the clouds, and they never fail to move me. They always seem to travel in couples, one after the other, like pairs of faithful friends, and they are always flying purposefully to the West. I assume they are airliners from England or perhaps from the continent of Europe on their way to America, but it is the silent enigma of their passage that fascinates me. I get the same sense of mystery from birds. Day after day, I wonder as I watch the birds in our garden or down by the seashore, what on earth they are all up to and what enables or obliges them to do whatever it is they are doing. Today, for instance, a small flock of terns flew over my head and settled on the sea's surface a few hundred yards out. I watched them attentively through my binoculars. And what do you think they were doing? They were doing absolutely nothing at all. They simply sat there gently bobbing up and down with the tide. They were not eating anything or foraging or even apparently communicating with each other. They simply sat there on the sea until quite suddenly for no apparent reason, they rose from the water as one and flew back over my head into the fields behind. What were their purposes? Were they preparing for some immense migratory flight later in the year? Were they obeying some celestial instructions? Whatever their intentions or obligations, I saw them as remote ancillaries of those high white vapor trails, silently, silently navigating the Empyrean. Beautiful, thank you so much. Why did you select that particular day? Because it, I, I adore travel and I adore those moments which I think traveling brings to life and which you can bring back into your own home where you sit somewhere you've never been before and you feel instantly at home and you have a cup of coffee and you've never tasted it before and you're soaking in the smells and the sounds and everything is unfamiliar and everything is homely at the same time. That, that sense of almost, I mean, coming back to Virginia Woolf, almost that you've, you know, the, the curtain has um, lifted and you get that sort of peek behind and in that moment, just of being at home in, in her little corner of Wales, that sense of that both deep connectedness and that wonder of being on a magical journey, I, I love it. And I, I love how she could take that and, and find it not just you know in every corner of the world, but find it in her corner of Wales as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about memoir as a particular form for, mm. for, for Jan and for, for trans writers at the, at the moment, that it, it seems to be the exemplary form in mm. which trans identity is being expressed. And I wonder how we place Jan in that tradition and if you if you think that it is the, I mean, why is it the, the form at the moment? I think it, it's got a long history as a form and I personally think it, it would be quite a good time for it to die off as a primary form. Um, and I say this as someone, maybe I, I have a chip on my shoulder because I, I use life writing in my work, but I have not written a memoir and I, I don't plan on writing a memoir. And yet I am often said, oh, you've written a memoir and you're thinking, no, <laughs> yeah, I really haven't. You, if you've read it, you would know I haven't. Um, and I'm not trying, I think memoir is a tremendous form and I, I love reading it, but it grew out of, I, th I think we can argue quite convincingly that it grew out of the sex ecological patient accounts from the 19th century. And it became sort of the primary form that we understood gendered sexual minorities was as a unburdening of the self to a sympathetic ear. And again, we see that through very early texts like the diary of an androgen um, to a co-authored work um, by Carl Embert and, and Magnus Hirschfeld in very early 20th century called The Memoirs of a Man's Maiden Years, which still has the best title ever. Um, and I, I find it fascinating, I find it useful, but I think it reaches a point where it doesn't move us forward and it doesn't allow us as trans authors to do more. And what I think is very sad is that in, in lots of independent presses, trans authors are doing more. And Jan Morris, you know, in all of her writing, she did more. Um, and I would love to see memoir maybe come back into a, a broader um, selection, a broader menu of choices that we could make rather than being the only, the only option on the menu, which I think currently it is. Yes. Um, and I think it, you know, it follows a set pattern, which again is very much set out in the early sexological reports. You know, when did you know? How old were you? What did you do about it? Now, here's the the peak of our story. Here's here's the surgery, and then we subside down and we yes. and again. And 
Yeah, I think we can have more fun. And again, yeah. thinking about Jan as being someone very mischievous, I would love to see more. And, and again, from independent presses, I think we are, we're seeing sci-fi novels and love stories and incredible poetry collections um, it, or children's books and graphic novels. You know, I, I just want all of them. I want to be greedy and grab them all. Um, that's exciting, isn't it? That, that, I, that new, new frontier of that form of writing or mm. that, form, that, that mode of expression, I think mm. that's very exciting. Can we... Can we turn to Jan's last posthumous book, Allegorizings? Mm. Um, I think you've all read it. You all have it. At least. I'm afraid I have not. Jan hasn't. No. We'll send you a copy soon. Thank you. I would really appreciate it. Over. Um, but I wonder, Apiko and Sarah, um, how you see this book in the context of Jan's career? What, what is this book trying to do, do you think? I, I see it as a companion piece to um, the Trieste book, which almost was a culmination of her writing life and her valedictory, her farewell to place writing really through disguised memoir, I would say. And as I was listening to you and CN talk a minute ago, I was thinking that my sense is she remade the form of travel writing by turning it into um, uh, this impressionism we've been discussing. And I think she only wrote one novel, but it was certainly a novel not like most people's. And she sort of um, upended the, the genre of memoir by writing a memoir without disclosing too much of herself, I felt. But conversely, that passage that CN wrote when I uh, read, when um, she was describing the clouds flying west together, I thought that's a self-portrait of, of Jan and Elizabeth. And one of the remarkable things she did is James Morris became Jan Morris and <laughs> sailing imperturbably forwards, lived with Elizabeth 61 years as if nothing had ever changed. And that's one of the other beautiful mysteries of, of Jan, that uh, mm -hmm. the kind of thing that would lead to so much soul searching for many people. She seemed just to, to carry off uh, lightly, which takes us away from um, from your your question, but I think allegorizing is a is a sort of playful coda and and footnote to the many other self portraits she's given us. Sarah, did you want to add to that? I kind of read it as a provocation from beyond the grave. I mean, there's something so <laughs> knowing and playful and almost manipulative about the way she writes about death and her own dying in that book. And she knows it's not going to be published until after she's dead. And that therefore, by the time you're reading it, she's speaking from the great beyond. And there's almost something like her travel writing in that or her place writing. She's really pushed, I mean, you, you know, the bound from which no traveler returns. It, it, you can't write about your own death. You can't write about being dead. You can't write from beyond the grave, but she's really kind of pushing at that one and kind of mocking and provoking. And it's it's balanced on the edge of the impossible. And you know that, and she knows that, but she's still doing it. Mm -hmm. To that extent, it seems like a final sort of high wire act of how, you know, how far can you go and what can you get away with? It's kind of outrageous actually as a book. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed that, but I was also, yeah, it's just, really hard to know how to read it because when she keeps saying everything is an allegory and I'm allegorizing I was thinking I'm not sure I get it you know I don't I'm not sure I see the allegory and maybe I'm not a very good reader here maybe you know maybe I'm failing but I also think I think we're all failing or she knows that we're all failing or there's something there's something really mischievous about that yeah we should say for people who have not yet read it that I mean, the book has a thesis, as it were, or a kind of gambit, which is that um, Jan writes, I have begun to think that my life itself is one long allegory. And the older I get, the more my conviction grows. And I, you're, you're right, Sarah, it's quite hard to understand quite what that means. I don't know, Pico, if you 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 got to the bottom of it, what, the, what Jan means by that. No, I, I agree with both of you. <laughs> she, she sets up this premise and then flits away from it, really. Um, but it's interesting that it's a book about getting old and approaching death, and yet there's no fragility in it and, and, and very little fear. And at certain points, she describes falling on her face more than once in many cities in the world. But um, again, no, no poignancy or self-pity there. Yes, yeah. I, well, listening to you, the three of you talk, I started to wonder whether perhaps this is a very basic way of thinking about it, but that in all the ways that Jan is writing about not herself, but about other places, that she is also writing about herself, that the clouds that she sees are her and Elizabeth, as you say, Pico, and that there is a kind of very um, subtle 
subjectivity, to use the word that Sarah was squeamish about, that is is in the work, and that is Jan, without being overbearing. And so that the things that she writes about are allegories of her sensibility, her subjectivity. Um, I don't know if that's right, but I think that's part of the mischief of the book, isn't it? Um, absolutely. Um, Pika, did you want to come in there? Well, well, I did, because I think I would tie that in with what Sarah said earlier about the places she has been and the places she hasn't. And I think that's the ultimate compliment, that, um, that it, it, it doesn't really matter. But I do feel that even though we always feel this presence of Jan in everything she writes, I think she's one of the most reliable guides to cities and, and other themes that I can think of. Um, and if I wanted to know, as, as Sarah was saying before, what, what Trieste is like, or, or actually Hong Kong or uh, Sydney or Toronto, she's the only person I would turn to. I wouldn't turn to somebody who lived in those cities. And I, it's no other traveler I could think of that uh, I would have so much faith in her instincts. So the, the interplay of the subjectivity and this extraordinary gift for responsiveness and observation, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably part of the, the great magic of, of Jan. That's quite a compliment, isn't it? I, I wonder whether I can turn to the, the three of you more personally, whether you might be able to speak as we as we come to the end of our conversation, how she how she influenced you, how she's influenced your your work. Is there a way that you might be able to identify Jan's influence exert, exerted on your own writing and, and, and or, or work more broadly? CN, perhaps you could speak to that. I think one of the reasons I chose the extract I did is because I love the rhythm uh, and I think the use of words is so extraordinary and yet at the same point it's it, it's occasionally purple but it's very frequently not flashy it, it manages to have that conversational tone with those little moments of glory that just capture you and sort of you feel that lift and for me as a non-fiction writer, as, as opposed to sort of the fiction that I write and, and no one gets to read, um, it, it's something I'm always aiming for is that sense that it, it's the best of conversation. And it is, it is that elevated sense of conversational style that, that yet has within it the, the rhetoric. And I, I think about, you know, I do wonder about that childhood being a chorister. And I think, you know, as a, as a sort of former sort of choral scholar, I wonder how much that call and response and that musical intonation, how much it played, because when you read these words, they they flow, they hit their beats, they hit their beats and then they'll do a little repetition, a little cadence. Um, and that, you know, beyond any sense of the content of the writing is what I'm looking to express as a nonfiction writer. And what I love most in reading nonfiction is that sense of falling within um, a rhetorician's grasp and loving every ebb and flow of their storytelling. Sarah? I, I really love that, yes. And I think that that matters to me as well. And I, I don't think it's particularly a quality of nonfiction either. I think you, you can do it in fiction. It's probably one of the things I have learned from, from reading her. But I think certainly thinking about my own travel writing, which I do more, more as essays than books, it's that way of being unashamed of her own vulnerability and uncertainty and alienation. And I think there are other writers who do that. I mean, I come back to Jonathan Rabin and Kathleen Jamie, but they're doing it after her. And I think the idea that alienation can be a position of narrative strength rather than weakness in relation to place writing. I mean, we've known that in relation to fiction since the 18th century, but that you can approach a place with uncertainty and, and a sense of not belonging and that that's actually a, yeah, a, a position of narrative and intellectual strength was really important to me. Okay. Well, I think I, I already confessed that writing on place when I began writing, I was much too influenced by Jan, but I can't think of a better person to be influenced by. And I still can't think of anyone really who writes like her, which is another very high compliment. Uh, when I, I started to feel that I had to go inward more, then I had to leave Jan behind because I think as we've been saying, she, she's coy and she plays complicated games and she talks about allegory but doesn't really push hard into it. Uh, but uh, I, I still suspect there'll never be uh, another Jan. And when I was reading Allegorizings, I was thinking there's such warmth in the book and yet such a sense of adventure. And there are not many people who can travel to the far ends of the world uh, and still keep their, their poise intact and their sense of delight uh, un, uninjured. 
Um, Thank you so much, Pico Ayo, Sarah Moss, and CN Lester. Allo Grazings by Jan Morris is out now, as is Sarah's new novel, The Fell. And if you'd like to learn more about RSL events, do visit our webpage. We hope you might join us again. In the meantime, happy reading and goodbye. <laughs>